the Arctic. Up until recently, a boundless icy wilderness protected by the vast ice cap of the North Pole. As the polar ice melts, the oil industry is dreaming about making major oil and gas finds in this more or less virgin territory. Violent conflicts and war in the world's most affluent oil states are adding fuel to this dream. But who is entitled to extract future oil and gas reserves in the Arctic? Where do the borders run in this icy territory? History has shown us that this is an extremely dangerous situation. Will a world that is becoming increasingly dependent on oil respect national boundaries and historical territorial claims and resolve border conflicts in a peaceful manner? The Arctic, the last continent where borders are not agreed upon. Rich oil and gas reserves have intensified territorial negotiations between the USA, Russia, Canada, Norway and Denmark. The ice race has in fact started. Who will succeed and who will suffer in this cold battle? Border conflicts have been occurring in Arctic areas for many years, particularly conflicts between indigenous populations and the oil industry. This also applies to the Nenets people in Russia, a minority population consisting of around 50,000 people. Zoya Vilkaravna is a member of the indigenous Nenets people, but she's lived away from the Russian tundra for a long time. She's now returning to her homeland in the far north of Russia, where she becomes witness to the fact that their traditional grazing grounds have been invaded by a new industry. Fackel, for fackel, for fackel. One kilometer, one kilometer. And it burns. And it also burns in... Nästan hjärtat mitt när jag såg hur förfärdelig det var. Så åt jag lagt elver, fiske vann, och sen precis som det byggs nya vägar, massa massa olja och gasledningar överallt. Det är tragiska ändringar. Väldigt. Vad har vad som kommer att ske? Regnfolk blir rätt och slett eh, ignorerat och oljesällskapen kan utvinna eh, olja eller gas, tjäna pengar, bygga stora installationer runt omkring. Men samtidigt finns det inte någon eh, lov som säger hur stor kompensation de ska betala. De följer sig i rana och glömt. Although Zoya moved to Tromsø in Norway 10 years ago, she has regular contact with her home. In her capacity as research assistant at the Norwegian Polar Institute, she's involved in mapping industrial developments in the tundra. And as the areas marked on this map show, the oil and gas industry has made considerable encroachments on both land and water in what is considered by the Nenets people to be their homeland.
During the Cold War, the ice-free port of Murmansk was important from a strategic point of view. After many years of stagnation, it's now to be developed once more due to its proximity to the massive oil and gas reserves in the Arctic. Murmansk regularly hosts large oil and gas conferences. The world's largest oil companies are fighting each other for the attention of the Russian state-owned gas giant Gazprom, which is in charge of the development of the world's largest gas field, the Stockmann field. This field contains around 3.8 trillion cubic meters of gas. It's also the world's most challenging petroleum project since it's located 600 kilometers from land in areas covered by ice. Нефтесодержащие ресурсы у нас очень высокие, а разведенность у нас очень очень низкая. То есть на сегодняшний день, если взять Баренцево море, то у нас разведено все там немножко более 20%. Although the conference is open to journalists and others, local journalist Dmitry Ischenko tries to find out more about Gazprom's prestigious project and contacts the company's representative, Vladimir Vovk. This proves to be easier said than done. Сложно работать с вопросами нефти и газа, потому что с одной стороны, как мы видели на конференции, все демонстрируют открытость и готовность делиться информацией друг с другом. Но с другой стороны, вот мне это все немного напоминало такой театр, потому что вот эти вопросы нефти и газа, они настолько чувствительные для всех стран. Газпром has acquired huge powers under Russia's former president and current prime minister Vladimir Putin. This company is the world's largest gas producer and Russia's only gas exporter. And most of Russia's gas is extracted from Arctic territory. Putin's close relations with Gazprom have been subjected to heavy criticism by courageous critics in present-day Russia. There is something to worry about for the countries which are dependent on energy imports these days because Russia recently have been demonstrating uh, the increased desire and uh, inclination to resource nationalism, uh, to uh, using resources as a tool of achieving certain political and economic goals both domestically and internationally. Sometimes we have seen energy resources being used as a political weapon. Russia's invasion of Georgia was particularly frightening. Although Russia's offensive had a different express target, it cannot be entirely divorced from Russia's oil and gas interests. The huge pipeline which runs through Georgia to Turkey actually competes directly with Gazprom's pipeline. Russia has been wanting to gain control of gas deliveries to Europe for a long time, and history shows that the supply of energy through conflict areas serves to create border conflicts, unstable deliveries, and intensified military activities due to an increased need for security. With its Nord Stream project, Russia is trying to avoid such problems by laying a pipeline via the Baltic Sea from the Barents Sea to Germany. In order to get Gazprom to talk about their Nord Stream plans, you need to speak to spokesman Sergei Kuprianov at head office in Moscow. Другое дело, что это важный проект для Европы и для России с точки зрения повышения надежности доставки газа в Европу с точки зрения снижения транзитных рисков. Вот в этом смысле это действительно крайне важный проект, который рассчитан на 
объем транспортировки газа 55 миллиардов кубометров, это примерно треть от э, объемов, поставляемых Газпромом в страны Западной Европы. Абсолютно реалистично. Gazprom's spokesman denies that the invasion of Georgia was an attempt to remove a troublesome competitor. Даже в августе 2008, когда шли боевые действия, газ продолжал поступать и на территорию Грузии, и на территорию Армении через Грузию. Поэтому уж в данном случае совершенно точно связывать эти вопросы нет никаких оснований. Kupryanov's assurances are counteracted by these pictures of bomb craters near the Georgian pipeline. The bombs are said to have been dropped by Russian fighter jets. And security is the very reason why the enormous oil pipelines crossing the borders of several countries, along with Russia's brutal behavior in Georgia, are causing concern in several European countries about border conflicts and over-dependence on gas from the Russian part of the Arctic. I think it raises the question of how far Russian authorities are ready to go to uh, elevate the stakes in, in their power play. Zoya travels back to her home territory in order to study what's happening on the tundra and faces many challenges in this respect. The legacy left by the Cold War is still apparent in this area, and oil is being extracted more or less without supervision. There are comprehensive security checks and many areas are also close to foreigners. For Zoya, this is a border conflict. Her parents were once able to roam here freely, but that was before the oil. Russian authorities have historically used the indigenous people as a political tool to manifest their presence in the Arctic. In 1877, they staked their claim to the strategically located island of Novaya Zemlya by moving a number of nenets there, including Zoya's parents. During the Soviet era, and especially under Joseph Stalin, the nomadic culture of the Nenets and their reindeer herding activities were brought under communist control. The Nenets were subsequently hit hard by the Cold War. The Soviet Union detonated a total of 224 nuclear bombs close to their settlements. The Nenets and the Vilka family were forcibly evacuated in 1955 from Novaya Zemlya to the village of Narian Mar on the mainland. That was where Zoya Vilka Ravna grew up. Нарьян-Мар, Красный город, так назвали немцы центр своего национального округа. Я вокс тут по тундре, сама не мифрали драмина, со теля были сирка секса органы. Я вокс тут и упал, фиг, ганский брал удалинг, со над викунды да фуршетты видра, это ви были ферди ме скуле. Я, for example, бистем тома я студиер в университете Санкт-Петербург и педагогик, но он хада андре интересер. The battle over natural resources in the Arctic pursued the Nenets into the tundra. Reindeer migration was disturbed by oil operations and the rivers were polluted by oil leaks. One of the worst examples of how badly their rights were affected was an incident that occurred in 1981, 40 kilometers away from Zoya's home village when a gas well exploded. And for the first time, one of the drilling managers has talked about what had happened. Practically, 
жидкостью скважины. It wasn't possible to stop the massive fire which burned out of control for a whole year. When the drilling management decided to stop the fire once and for all, they used a nuclear explosion. This nuclear explosion was unsuccessful, and the final resort was to drill a relief well. Stopping the blowout took five years altogether. The Nenets territory has today been designated as a nature reserve to which no outsiders are permitted access. This enormous accident and other major encroachments made on the tundra are the reasons why Zoya thinks that it's important to map developments. Vi har kontakt med myndighetene og de lar oss arbeide, men vi opplever at vi ikke får informasjon fra dem som ikke vi får fra antall eller på andre måter. Vi ser mer på internett på Google Earth enn det vi får av informasjon fra de sentrale myndighetene. Zoya har arrivet i Tarko Sala, som ligger i Nenets territory i Siberia. She meets her brother Sergei, who now works as an artist and has been involved in creating a sculpture of a traditional Nenets person. A reminder about who lived there first. Because what was once best known as a small Nenets trading center along the river Pur is now a rapidly growing Klondike town, which also refers to itself as the energetic heart of Russia, and for good reason. Because around 12% of Russia's oil and 90% of its gas come from this area. Like Zoya, her brother Sergei has stopped living on the tundra to live in a flat with his wife Diana and daughter Snezhana. This is the first time that Zoya has met her niece, who's received a different start in life to the one Zoya had. <laughs> Det är en väldigt stor dilemma. Alltså samfunnen får ju tillbaka i form av pengar för stora fina hus, flott skola. De alla har rättighet i Tarkosale eller i Harambur. Men de flesta som vi snackar på, de har sagt att det är inte det de ute efter egentligen. Det är inte hus de tränger, det är inte bil de tränger. De tränger ren natur. De tränger beter till sin ren och de tränger ett rent ekonomisk kompensation, så att de kan leva vidare av fisk, av regn, av jakt. Alexander är en exempel av en Nenets man som vill leva sitt liv i en traditionell manner. Zoya först mött honom 10 år ago during the recording of another documentary, and even at that time Alexander was engaged in a conflict with the oil industry. Ну собирали бы вот, собирали вот нам лично нас. Именно не спрашивает. Mm -hmm. Вот недавно, в этом году, я написал господину Ламбину, мы ему по шестой написали, о том, что в этой земле медвежка, как родовые угодьи, чтобы пули ну, наши, без нашего ветома, чтобы никто тут близко не пошел. Факела кто никто не в пуру не вставлял. Вот. Подписали, отправили Ламбину. Вот Кис староста подписал, как сельсовет. Speaking on the phone, Alexander has told Zoya that she would be welcome to visit his camp on Bear Mountain, but the authorities want Zoya to go somewhere else.
When Zoya protests, she receives another phone call. Suddenly, the local guide says that he doesn't want to accompany her, making excuses about ruined bridges and rivers in full spate. I don't know details, and I don't know what it's about, but in any case, it's very negative. So, there's something that happens. I said earlier that it's a mess here. There's something that I don't understand. As Zoya feared, other indigenous people have been arrested. As Zoya feared, other indigenous people around the whole Arctic polar basin are also saying that no one will listen to them as they jockey for position in the petroleum resources game. The indigenous people know from bitter experience that the oil companies, the Arctic nations and other international parties quickly forget their historical rights. Organizations representing the indigenous populations also regard future oil and gas revenue as a historical opportunity to acquire a better life and fairer self-government in their areas. This applies particularly to Canada and here in Greenland. But for instance, in Greenland, there's a lot of uh, political support and also support from, from the population to, to start oil, oil exploration because they, they can see it as a way of, of gaining more independence. After two-thirds of the Inuits on Greenland voted for independence, this was established in 2009. This took place at the same time as test drilling started in the region about half of the revenues will stay in the country. With the change in climate, due to the oil, we are in fact seeing that uh, there are new areas that, uh, that you can work in where it was not possible to acquire seismic data just a few years ago. One of the key uh, hurdles so far is to have an agreement on, on sharing the resources between neighboring countries because this area, as you know, is one of the rare areas where uh, uh, the sharing of the, res uh, of the territory between the neighboring countries has to be done. Uh, this is uh, uh, very high on the agenda now because every country is in the, in the framework of the United Nations uh, Convention of, on, on, on Law of the Sea uh, is presenting their claim about extending of their uh, continental shelf and all the neighboring countries have claims that are of course incompatible so a lot of uh, political discussion and bargaining has to be uh, achieved. August 2007. Russia's two mini-subs, Mir-1 and Mir-2, are undertaking a historical journey beneath the North Pole point. The leader of the expedition is the Russian presidential advisor, Artur Chilingarov. I wanted to be in our world history as a great geographical discovery. To know this in the whole world, as they know those who first conquered the Southern and Southern Polis, as the UNU and who came out of the cosmos first. Chilingarov's comparison with the moon gives the trip a historical flavor. The submarines are named after Mir, Russia's largest space station. The submarines have descended to the amazing depth of 4,200 meters. The trip took a total of eight hours. On their way up, Mir 1 loses radio contact and Chilingarov is unable to find his way back to the hole in the ice. The battle to become the first person to reach the North Pole point has long traditions. In 1926, the Norwegian Roald Amundsen was the first person to fly over the North Pole in an airship. When he crossed the pole point, he released a Norwegian flag. As on previous expeditions, Chilingarov's expedition was funded by rich investors, including a Swedish pharmaceuticals billionaire and a sheik from the oil-rich United Arab Emirates. А там нефть и газ там. Сегодня нефть и газ России добывают в основном в Арктическом регионе. Мы в основном в этом районе. Дальше идет шельф. Когда отсюда все выкачаем, мы должны идти дальше искать ресурсы. After a nervous half-hour, 
the submarines manage to find the hole in the ice. But as Mir-1 surfaces, it collides with the ship's hull, breaking its roof hatch. The expedition experiences several moments of panic. Shaken, but pleased to have been successful, Chilingarov participates in the celebrations. <laughs> this expedition will also shake the world because Chilingarov planted a durable titanium Russian flag beneath the North Pole Point. Copy Titanova flag, which will stay there forever. Мы в этом уверены. Ну, юг, ну там небольшая, значит, э, значит, не так много ива, чтобы он, он нормально стоит. Вот такой флаг сделанный специально для того, чтобы мог стоять там вечно. Место есть. Was Chilingarov's privately funded expedition really a Russian conquest of the seabed beneath the North Pole? Da Arthur Schillingarum, som jo er eh, helt både av Sovjetunionen og av det nye Russland, eh, plantet flagget på Nordpolen, så, så reiste det seg jo en internasjonal storm. Hva skal dette bety? Schillingarum er visepresident i Durman. Han har gjenopptatt etableringen av isstasjoner i det sentrale Polav, mens for eksempel amerikanerne har slutt med dette. Så denne karen, han, han har en status i systemet som gjør at uh, det er vanskelig å tro at han uh, gjennomførte et helt privat stønt uten en eneste politisk overtone. Zoya has arrived in Karnat, which lies 30 minutes by boat from Bear Island, and Alexander's camp, which is called Asida. This is where Zoya wants to go, but the authorities have contacted her again, demanding that she should change her plans. Zoya wants to see the development at Bear Mountain with her own eyes and refuses to cooperate. She makes her own arrangements for a boat that can take her up the river, but the mayor wants to stop her. While Zoya is waiting for the captain to prepare the boat, the mayor, Maria Klimova, turns up in person to stop her. An argument breaks out which lasts for several minutes. After threatening Zoya with the Federal Security Service, the FSB, Zoya agrees to visit the Voyantor camp, which is obviously more loyal towards the mayor. Zoya receives a warm welcome from the Nenets people in the Voyantor camp. They used to make their living from reindeer herding, but the reindeer disappeared five years ago. Now they just live here during the summer and make their living from fishing. They spend the rest of the year living in houses in the town. When Zoya interviews people in the camp, their dissatisfaction starts to emerge. They miss the old days when they could keep reindeer in the area and the river was unpolluted by oil. They're concerned that their traditional method of living is in the process of dying out. They are missing the rain, rain, or rain, the bitter leaf for them, I think. Things that the whole culture is based on, they disappear. Plus that we will be Russified, that we will be some vanly, vanly folk. After the Russians planted their flag on the seabed beneath the North Pole, other Arctic nations also started to make their mark. Research vessels, icebreakers, military aircraft, and ships were sent northwards as they sought to establish a national presence the like of which had not been seen for many a year.
Just a year after the Russian expedition, Norway's Crown Prince Håkon travelled to the Arctic on the Swedish icebreaker, the Odeon. His special companions were the Swedish and Danish heirs to the throne, Victoria and Frederick. Skal vi gå op ad trappen der, og så forbi det svenske flagget? Det verkar bra. Det er vakkert. Det blir også vakkert til den norske polarlinjen. Ja. <laughs> the aim of this trip was the Norwegian island of Svalbard. Officially, they were going to study climate change, but the hullabaloo caused by Russia's flag-planting expedition made it difficult not to connect their presence to the border conflict in the north. Okay, it's like a hole in one. Yeah. 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 It was a way for them to express national interest in the region. And the explored territories were often given royal names. Я не люблю проигрывать. Поэтому, конечно, раз мы декларировали, что мы хотим доказать, что арктический шельф идет дальше и доходит на, на территории, в том числе до полюса, мы должны это доказать. И не имеем права не доказать. Если мы смотрим только на русский сектор, который в интернациональной политике и хаврет, то это ca 43% от полубассейна. Og når de da innenfor den sektoren har verdens største sokkel, og denne sokkelen i tillegg stort sett er meget grunn, og nå blir kvitt isen over seg, og i tillegg er antatt å være svært rik på olje og gass, så er det klart at her snakker vi om et lite smykke for en nasjon. For these countries, the great race for resources is also about documenting where the outer limits are located on the seabed, because these have still not been completely mapped. This is a highly inaccessible area due to the ice. Scientists have therefore mapped the outer limits of the Norwegian continental shelf by engaging in seismic exploration. This documentation ends up in the UN building here in New York, where it's subjected to thorough investigation and approved by the UN Continental Shelf Commission, which has 21 members, including a Norwegian called Harald Brekke. Vanligvis så tenker vi så at kontinentalsokkelen kan strekke seg ut til 200 nautiske mil, altså det er så langt ut vår jurisdiksjon går. Men Havrettskonvensjonen sier at i noen tilfeller kan man gå enda lenger ut. Og det vil i prinsippet si at de kan gå ut så langt som kontinentet strekker seg under havet. Og et kontinent verden rundt har stort sett en, en grunn sokkel rundt seg. Og ytterst på sokkelen så stuper det ned mot fra noen hundre meter ned til en 3-4-5 tusen meters vanndyp. Du skal bruke foten av den skråningen som utgangspunkt for målingen din. 60 nevetiske mil fra denne skråningsfoten og utover kan du sette grensen for kontinentalsokkelen. Despite the fact that we had been given permission to film one of the Commission's meetings, we were surprised to discover that we were denied access. This also says something about the highly sensitive nature of these negotiations. I ask you not to film inside the oh. conference room. Oh, I can't film here. It's forbidden to take any kind oh, okay. of okay. Okay. Out, inside, you. okay? I, I Just I outside. You. Until fairly recently, a lot of the documentation presented had been classified as military secrets. The Arctic was the battlefield of the Cold War. The submarines of the superpowers, equipped with intercontinental nuclear missiles, spent most of their time beneath the ice, since they were obvious targets in the event of a war. Since these submarines were completely dependent on knowledge about the seabed and the ice, this data had been classified as being top secret. After the Cold War, 
Norway acquired access to some of this material, but a lot of it still remains secret. Norwegian scientists managed to engage in cooperation with one of the American submarines, which was collecting new, decisive deep water data. This has provided Norway with a unique opportunity to maneuver and submit its continental shelf claims to the United Nations on the basis of sound documentation. Russia has also kept secret a lot of its knowledge about the North Pole. Russia's submarines have been exploring the seabed for a number of years, and since 1954, their so-called drifting ice stations have been exploring and mapping this area. In their heyday, these bases were manned by 2,000 operators. The Russian database containing knowledge about ice is thought to be the largest in the world. It's difficult for the scientists of other countries to gain access to it. This sort of knowledge also concerns how Russian submarines are able to operate and find thin ice for launching their nuclear missiles. Seismic data gives you an oversight over the strength of the havbun, and the havbun is important also for military strategic avskräckning. Här kan det, man tänka sig att det ligger ubåtar stille på havbunden för att inte ge sig en lyd, men de är i operation i fall de skulle få besked om att trycka på de knappen vi alla håber de inte ska trycka på. Unlike Russia and the other countries located around the polar basin, Norway's comprehensive seabed claims have been considered by the UN's Continental Shelf Commission, and the results were a huge victory, with Norway acquiring sovereignty over an area the size of England off the islands of Svalbard and Jan Mayen. Other countries haven't been quite so involved in providing documentary evidence of their comprehensive claims in the Arctic. In the last four years, we have, with the exception of the border line with Russia, avklart alle utestående spørsmål, både når det gjelder kontinentalsokkenes utstrekning og en del eh, heltrukne linjer i grenser med eh, Danmark, Grønland, med Island, Færøyene, eh, slik at det nordlige området har helt avklarte grenser, og det er viktig. The final dividing line between Norway and Russia has now been agreed after 40 years of on-off negotiations. Expectations are high as to what resources the region has to offer. Det utgjør landområdet til Danmark, Belgia og Nederland til sammen. Så vi snakker her om et stort landenorm som skulle, som skulle deles mellom to stater. Og når de to statene da i tillegg var av den oppfatning at her kunne det være mye ressurser, særlig olje og gass, så kompliserte det forhandlingene. Nevertheless, Russia and Norway have reached agreement on a border line with plenty of issues still to be dealt with. All these countries in Arctic zone now is a little bit nervous. And it's not only the problem of Norway. It's, I see the same situation in Russia. We also are more aggressive in this region than it was three or five years ago. For Norway, it's always been important to maintain a territorial claim and show a presence on Svalbard, both by having permanent settlement there and commercial activities such as mining. For there is no doubt, no question about sovereignty over Svalbard. It was declared in 1920. Det er Norge. Det er like mye Norge som her vi sitter i Oslo. Norske lover, norske regler gjelder, og det er norske myndigheter som bestemmer. But Norwegian sovereignty has always been fragile. The Svalbard Treaty of 1920 gives all nations the opportunity of establishing business activities on the islands. The Russians have done this for years. Even though most nations accept the Norwegians' claim on Svalbard, not all agree with the fact that sovereignty should also apply to the seabed around the islands. Apart from the Norwegian-Russian border conflict, there are also a number of other unclarified border issues. 
Since the 1980s, the Danes and the Canadians have been arguing about who owns a tiny island called Hans Island in the straits between Greenland and the Canadian island of Ellesmere. Important because of oil and gas which have been found in the area. And the island is located in a strategic position now that melting ice is making it possible to sail through some parts of the Northwest Passage. In 2002, Canada protested strongly when some Danish seamen planted their flag on the island. Canada has a conflict of interest with the United States and the European Union regarding the control of the Northwest Passage. The USA and the EU regard this as international waters. The Canadians have marked their sovereignty by dropping Canadian flags on border violators. Over the last few years, the Canadians have intensified their military presence in the Arctic. Now we already see the militarization of Arctic. Uh, we see, uh, for example, the preparation for maybe some serious uh, battles in future. So Arctic, of course, is one of the most, uh, I think, problematic uh, geopolitical zones in the world. Following lengthy negotiations, Zoya has been given permission to visit Bear Mountain. At last, she can renew her acquaintance with her old friend Alexander. But something must be wrong. Alexander isn't in the camp. Zoya finds him some distance away. Although he's pleased to see her, he has some bad news. Han blev uppringd för vi kom hitta fyra gånger faktiskt från administrationen i Tarkosalet. Han skulle bara säga till oss att vi inte är välkomna här, att det är inte möjligt att komma för det är massor av eller något sånt. Massor av överhistorier egentligen. Trist, trist och skräcklig kanske också. The mayor of Karampur claims that Alexander has now accepted the activities of the oil companies. Александр Учетович, вот у кого вы были. И он следил, принимал работу, чтобы не там не власти там ходили, да, указывали, как им надо. Вот он с ними ходил и показывал, где правильно проезжать, как реки переезжать. И после этого он у них работу принимал, чтобы после себя все убрали. Вот яркий пример к этому. Björnefjäll sitter nu i en sån typ av isolation, både socialt och ekonomiskt och politiskt kanske också. Från Harambur kommun, regnstjur försvinner, olinstallationer överallt, vart år skrumper deras land, press från olje och gas, industri kommer till att ödelägga samfundet deras som vi ser idag.
The ice race shows us that we are now standing at an important crossroads in our search for new sources of energy in this vulnerable environment, especially as regards oil. Energy sources like the sun, wind and hydroelectric power are still unable to replace established sources such as nuclear power, coal and oil. The world will therefore continue to be dependent on oil operations for many decades to come. This situation also impacts on the oil companies who, more than any other industry, are thinking long term. They consequently started looking north a long time ago, to the Arctic. As yet, there is no Klondike rush, but the race has started and it's a cold one. Geologists say that future oil and gas resources will be harvested from the Arctic. What we need now are the technological solutions that will be able to secure these resources for the world. Attempts are now being made to tame the Arctic like we tamed the depths and storms in the North Sea. We've been successful before and we can do it again. Something is brewing beneath the white polar ice. The hunt for black gold, oil, prompts unpleasant memories about other battles over resources. Particularly over fishing, which resulted in depleted stocks of fish and the Cod Wars. The Arctic was also a battlefield for the war games played during the Cold War in an area with indistinct borders. Current Arctic Ocean imperialism and the lines of conflict are clearly following old patterns and fronts. And, as previously, these conflicts are all related to the rich natural resources in these regions. The international community is trying to resolve and prevent forthcoming conflicts. They're seeking knowledge about the past in order to understand how we can face an uncertain future on our resource-rich northern front. In the middle of this international race, the indigenous people of the Arctic are fighting for the melting territory of their forefathers. They're faced with a dilemma Oil activities are contributing towards a warmer climate, but at the same time, such activities could strengthen their self-government. If the new race ends in major conflicts, it could well be the indigenous people who will be the first and biggest losers.